thank you for joining me in another session with my little tangerine tiger. Um, look what I've done. <clears throat> I've put a big lump of wood on the back of my machine. Well, actually, it's a silencer come duct that hopefully ducts the air right from the bottom up to here. And it does make it quieter sort of. You would also notice I've it connected up the extractor fan as well. So yeah we've got everything working more or less on this machine now. I decided to finish it off. The other thing that I found wasn't working quite properly was my air assist valve. What I found was that this switch here wasn't working properly at all. When I came to try and sort the problem out because the ground already had something in it and I didn't want to jam two wires into it I put the ground onto another place. Yeah, there was a ground on here. It wasn't working. Now, this really just comes back to something that I've long suspected and heard tell of, but never personally come into contact with a problem myself. That not only was this machine supplied with a, a B-grade tube and a B-grade power supply, but it's very likely that the most expensive part of it, which is the Ruida controller, was also B-grade as well. Now normally you would not find a problem. The most likely reason for a B-grade product like this is that there might be a missing memory cell somewhere that isn't working properly and the chances of you finding that you might find one of your programs goes wrong for some reason or other but you know the chances of you finding a problem like that is very very small but it looks as though I found a non-operative ground on this particular controller which tells me that despite the fact that it's got all these marks on it it probably is a B grade that's failed final test. While we happen to be in this controller I'm just going to point out to you something here which is a terminal called AN. In this case it's AN2 because it's a second for a second tube. Um, but in addition to that you'll see that we've also got this one here which is the PWM output. The question has to be asked why have we got both PWM and analog which is what the AN stands for output. Okay and this brings me nicely. Um, somebody was very polite and tactful and advised me that I wasn't fully understanding what PWM was all about. I have no problem with somebody telling me that because as I probably mentioned to you before as a mechanical engineer once I get beyond ankle deep into digital electronics I'm going to drown. So if anybody has got some good advice for me and can tell me how this machine actually works with PWM, I'm only too pleased to understand or learn. So what I'm going to do is to give you what I consider to be my understanding of what PWM is all about. Then we're going to go and do a little bit of investigation in the machine itself to see what goes into the black box and what comes out of the black box, because that answers the question. Now I think I already have answered that question but I'm going to go back and check it again using a slightly different approach. But something came to mind as I was considering whether or not I had misunderstood what this PWM on this machine was all about. I'm going to take you through what I've just mentioned on the controller. The controller has both an analog and a PWM output. Why? Well if you read the manual it recommends that you use the analog output with a glass tube and it recommends that you only use the PWM with an RF tube. Both my light blade machine and my China Blue machine, which are glass tube machines, both operate and were supplied with PWM. Here we have a very crude model of a glass tube system. Now the Rarita controller, you can do two things with it. You can press the pulse button and you can make the tube fire. And essentially what that's doing, that's switching this line here which goes into the power supply that allows current to flow through the tube. So we physically switch the tube on and off in the same way that we switch a light bulb on and off. There are two other control lines out of here which are actually controlling the power that comes out of the tube. Now it doesn't really control the power directly that comes out of the tube. The power supply itself has got a specification up to maybe say 30 milliamps. So that's quite a powerful tube, probably a 100 watt tube or something like that. When we put in 1% power, 
to the Ruida controller, we get virtually zero milliamps out of the power supply. And when we put 100% power, and in fact we can't, but we put 99% power into the Ruida controller, what we get is 30 milliamps. We get the full range. So the percent power has got nothing to do with watts. The percent power is all to do with a proportion of the output of the high voltage power supply. It's the current that will be allowed to flow through the tube. So this power supply is doing two things. It's supplying extremely high voltage, 20,000, maybe 30,000 in some instances, depending on the type of tube, to create the ionized nitrogen in the tube, that lovely pink beam that you see. Once you've broken that nitrogen down, from being a non-conducting gas, it all of a sudden becomes very conductive and can pass huge amounts of current. This power supply is performing two functions. One, it's generating enough voltage to turn gas into effectively a wire that allows current to flow. And then secondly, it's limiting the amount of current that you can allow to flow through that wire. And so that's what the secondary function of the power supply is. To control the milliamps, we start off with 0 to 99%. And what we then have to do is to send a signal to the power supply to tell it what we want. Do we want 100% power, 30 milliamps to flow, or nothing? If we connect the analog signal to the in, what we're doing, we're sending a signal which is naught to 5 volts DC. And that naught to 5 volts DC is equivalent to 1 to 99% power. So we've already coded that power as a signal, a voltage. But this is a DC analog voltage, which basically means that if we want, say, 50% power, we're going to output 2.5 volts into the power supply because we want 50% power. Now, the problem is, if I've got a 5 volt signal, 0, 5 volts, and I want 2.5 volts, then I'm outputting a 2.5 volt steady signal, which is 50% of the power, which is 15 milliamps, to flow through the tube. With 20,000 volts switching on and off rapidly, we've got a hell of a lot of radio frequency interference that's pervading the whole of the environment around this machine. It's very likely that our 5 volt signal here, which is right next to this big RF generator, could not look like that. It may well look like this. And if the input signal to here looks like this, then the output signal from here, your watts, is going to look like that as well. We want the most stable output that we can get. There's another route that we can take to sending that 5 volt signal into the power supply. And that is from this route here. It goes into the same port and it doesn't matter which one of these two you put in because there's a filter inside there which sorts out whether you're sending an analog or a PWM output. Now this is where the PWM is quite clever. As we've seen before with a PWM signal, that being zero, that being 5 volts, and if it's on for 50% of the time, and off for 50% of the time, that means the net average through there will be 2.5 volts. So hang on, this now means I've got a digital way of encoding this signal. So depending on the ratio of time that's on, in other words, if I make it only 10% on and 90% off, then I'm going to code a different voltage into the power supply. Now, once it gets to the power supply, the power supply doesn't work on this square wave. What it does, it decodes it and turns it back into an analog voltage, which is where it started off at. But it's basically digitized it to go down this line. Now, look, if I get a bit of interference on here, 
and a bit of interference on here and a bit of interference on here like that it doesn't make any difference because the decoding mechanism is looking for these massive changes it's able to ignore the rubbish that's on the signal because this is a digital signal it's no longer an analog signal so this is a very very clean way of making sure that we get nice smooth input signals to our power supply and once it's inside the power supply itself it can be converted back into an analog voltage where it is used to control the current that's flowing through the tube so in this particular instance the PWM is doing nothing more than producing a coded analog voltage inside the power supply so that we get a constant output and that's what this whole glass tube technology is all about now RF technology as I described to you in one of the earlier sessions is no different than this at the end of the day we're going to finish up with a pink beam that pink beam you can't see because it's inside a lump of metal and that lump of metal has got built into it some sort of power supply some sort of power supply but it's not the same sort of power supply that we've got for the glass tube I didn't think that the power supply was messing around in any way with the PWM signal. In other words, it was not trying to provide a constant current output. Because when I look at the big boy machines and look at the way in which their programs are written, and when I look at the specification for an RF tube, it says that I can use frequencies anything from 1 to 25,000 kilohertz. It must mean that what's being put through here is a signal which is a pulsing signal. Now, if I vary on here the PWM for this glass tube system, I mean, if, if my signal is like this, and I've drawn it like that, or like this, is the equivalent of saying don't touch that big red eject button too late this one says hey don't touch that big red button <laughs> there's a response time difference between the information that's being sent down a slow frequency signal as opposed to a high frequency signal the data is still encoded like this as a square wave if you mess around with the frequency on a glass tube machine all you're doing when you slow it down is you're slowing down the response time of the tube to any change that you ask it to make so when you want to jump from one power to another power it's going to take time now that has no real effect until you start doing things like um, 3D engraving or grayscale engraving um, or if you're using special mode in special mode you're relying on the PWM signal as your as your time base as far as a glass tube is concerned you don't mess around with the frequency at all but when it comes to the RF tube we don't have an on off signal for this RF unit all we have is this signal output here so therefore one has to assume that the switching takes place on this rising edge here or something once we get to a peak voltage because it is only the only signal that's going into this RF unit is this square wave and so when you feed it with a square wave it outputs something in the way of watts now I'm assuming and I have yet to change my mind on this that when I see this signal here for my 20 watt tube that I'm asking for 20 watts just because I've got 50% on and 50% off doesn't affect the fact that I'm getting 20 watts out of this tube I might be getting 20 watts for 50% of the time so on average I'm getting 10 watts but I'm not doing a 10 watt burn I'm doing a 20 watt burn for a fixed period of time because this machine is so fast at turning on and off that 
I'm getting 20 watt pulses. I'm not getting 10 watt pulses. And that's the way that I understand this machine to work. My test pattern that I developed that looks something like this. Where these pixels allow me to switch the tube on and off very quickly because I've got a 0.1 pixel, a 0.1 gap, a 0.1 pixel, a 0.1 gap. And here I've got a 0.1 pixel and a 0.3 gap. So I've got the ability by looking at this pattern to be able to measure what's happening to the power. Now up here, I've got continuous lines. Now continuous lines, as far as this machine, glass tube machine, means that I turn it on, and even though I've got pixels, se separate pixels in here, like this, those separate pixels are not read as separate pixels. What happens is, when I come to read that signal, I see it turning black. And it stays black until it gets to that point. And while it's turned on, I get power on. And then I get white, which is power off. And then it goes on again, off, on. And I get a string here of on, not a series of pulses. So my point is that if I look at this signal that comes out of this power supply for a continuous line perhaps it's not a continuous line it shouldn't be a continuous line if the signal is continuously turning on and off and on and off and on and off i should see breaks or pulses in that continuous line that clearly shows me that this machine is not operating in the same way that an ordinary glass tube machine works. It, we're not taking the PWM signal and converting it into an analog signal so that we can get a nice smooth steady output. We're leaving this PWM as a raw pulsed signal so that we can produce a pulsed output. And that's the whole supposed magic of the RF system. The further I get into this, the more I realise that there is no magic, just a simple pulsed signal. So if I've got 20 watts here to start with, and I'm only using it for 50% of the time, yes, I have got a degraded 20 watt signal, because I'm only getting, on average, 10 watts. But as I said, I'm not getting 10 watts. What I'm getting, I've got 20 watts, 20 watts, 20 watts, 20 watts, 20 watts. I'm getting a pulsed 20 watt signal. And so what I want to do today, to start with, is to make sure that we are seeing those pulses. And it's not, in some magic way, producing an average power. Obviously, the greater the frequency, the smaller these pulses will be. Just to put some numbers on it, if I can run this machine at 1,000 millimetres a second, and I've got a 254 PPI pattern, which is what I've got, then it means every one of those pulses is 0 0.1 of a millimeter. But if I run at a thousand millimeters a second, then technically every millimeter, one millimeter, happens in one second divided by a thousand, which equals one millisecond. So I travel a millimeter in a millisecond. So if I've got 0 0.1 pixels, my pixel is going to be travelled over in a tenth of that time, i.e. it's going to be 100 microseconds, 0 0.1 of a millisecond. So if my, if my pulse is 100 microseconds, it should just about cover a single pixel which is the sum of the stuff that I've been playing with up to now and I have been changing them to get half decent pictures. So I know that I've got control of something and I'm still convinced that it is control of the pulse length itself because I'm working with raw PWM signal. There is a the part of the specification for this tube which claims to tell you something about the rise and fall time of a pulse. 
Now in the glass tube system, it's completely understandable. This power supply has got a specification which says you will get 90% of your demand in less than one millisecond. And there are two things that have to happen. First of all, we have to get through the electronics. So the electronics happens very, very quickly. So we switch this signal on and it goes through the electronics here. But this electronics can switch on very quickly, but it can't make the current rise very quickly. Once you switch the tube off, the voltage has disappeared. There is a substantial amount of time and that's what this one millisecond is all about. We have to get this charged up to make the beam pink, which then allows the current to flow. You know, we switch the signal on, and at the same time as we switch the signal on, the voltage or the power starts to rise. So we want 50 watts of output. By the time one millisecond has passed, like this, we may or may not have reached 50 watts. We may or we may not have done, all right? It, it depends on the response time of your power supply. I happen to have a very good power supply in both my machines, and I know that I can get to that value in around about 0.25 milliseconds. How do I know that? Well, because I can get this little spike here, although we've got a one millisecond time period, I've got this little burst of energy which is just enough to produce a dot. And then it disappears. Although I'm asking it to print a pixel, I've got a little squirt of power that is so slow coming on that I just about get to the end of the pixel and I get a little pulse of power to burn a dot. Whereas with the RF, it turns on instantly, I get my power instantly, and I get a line and not a dot. That's the difference between these two systems. Right, now, you can play with this speed here. If I run too fast with my linear speed, I do not give this response time enough time to build up to give me a single pulse. It will give me a line, but what will happen is that line might start off faint and then become solid. And that's not the same so it appears with this RF machine. Although people are quoting at me 100 microsecond rise time and 100 microsecond delay off. So therefore, I've got 200 microseconds. Now, if this was true, how come I can see dashes like that, where each one of these dashes is in itself 100 microseconds long. So if the dash is only 100 microseconds long, if this were true, I wouldn't see anything at all. The first test we're going to conduct is based on this set of numbers here. Frequency of 5000, we're on 50% on and 50% off. Now, what that means is that the amount of on distance is 0.1, which is exactly the size of one of my pixels. And the pitch is 0.2. That's the distance between the pixels. And let's predict what we might see on a continuous line. The lines on my pattern are like that. And then occasionally there's gaps with two, and then maybe a four, and then maybe a three. There's all different lengths of lines on there with different numbers of pixels in. A dot, a gap, a dot, and a gap. That's what I expect to see when I look at that line. We've got 0.1 pixel and 0.2 pitch. So we should be producing pixels which look like this. Now in reality, what we're going to get is pixels that look like this. We're going to get a brown dash, but then we're going to get the beam. And I don't know what width the beam is, but whatever the width of the beam is, we're going to get half a beam width hanging out the end of each pixel. Now we can measure the line width and make sure that what we're seeing is correct. That's what I'm expecting to see 
if we are dealing with a raw PWM signal. If we're not dealing with a raw PWM signal, then I shall see a straight line. Now, to carry out this test, I'm using some red card. Now, this card I found to be very useful as a telltale material. I can take the dye out of the material and leave a white wood pulp behind, so we get quite a nice contrast on this material. I'm using the compound blends to get the finest possible dot that I can. Now I'm afraid you'll have to put up with a little bit of noise because I've got the uh, the cover off the back of the machine at the moment before the next part of this exercise that I want to carry out. And just so that we have a record of the settings, 1000 millimeters a second, 50-50 power, we're on scan mode, we've got a 0.1 pitch and we have got the frequency set to 5.005, in other words it's 5005 hertz, because if you remember 5 kilohertz is exactly the so-called pre-ignition frequency and that seemed to interfere with the pulse, pulses, so we've moved it just above 5 kilohertz. It's as simple as that. Okay, so we've got what I expected. I never have a problem with somebody calling my knowledge into question, because remember my knowledge has been gained by practical experience and I could be misinterpreting what I see but I don't think I'm misinterpreting this I know the signals that we put in and those signals are exactly what we're seeing here now the other question is about 100 microseconds 100, mi 100 microseconds rise time and 100 microseconds fall time just doesn't make any sense at all because here we've got a 100 microsecond pulse a 100 microsecond gap 100 microsecond pulse and 100 microsecond gap. If we had 100 microsecond rise time and 100 microsecond fall time, we wouldn't be seeing any of this. So, to all intents and purposes, this machine has got a pretty instantaneous rise and fall time. And I think that's all because it's, got, it's already sitting there at the top of the pre-ionisation zone, ready to switch the beam on at the instant that the electronics tells it to. There is no electronic delay. So there's no physics involved with this in the same way that there is physics involved with switching on and off a glass tube through the power supply. So this is all good news because it does mean to say we can now progress further knowing that we understand exactly how the PWM works on this machine. I mean I'm doing a thousand millimeters a second here. So this is running pretty fast and it's still switching on and off instantly enough to show that I've got virtually no, if you like, power build up. There is a little teeny weeny bit of power build up here because look, you can see the beginning of the pulse. If you like to regard that little white bit in the bottom there as being maximum power, then you can see that it is slightly shorter than probably a hundred microseconds. But the overall pulse width here is about 100 microseconds. Well, we'll just do one more test, because that's all we need. And that will be to leave the frequency exactly where it is, but this time we'll turn it on to 100% power. And 100% power should now produce continuous lines. And lo and behold, we have exactly what we expected. Look, we've got a continuous line this time. We've got no interruption because we've asked for 100% power, which is the PWM on all the time. And what we can see at the bottom here is, again, what we expected. We've got 100 microsecond pulses, not because we've set 100 microsecond pulses, because the pixels are switching them on and off at 100 microsecond intervals. But what we have got down here now is the width of the beam hanging out the end of the 100 microsecond pixels. So we've got a joined up string of pulses. We no need to go any further and investigate this. When we talk about PWM in the future, I hope that we will all understand what's happening with this machine. I'm going to, I'm going to be exploiting this most of the time because we need maximum power for cutting. If I had a 60, 80 or 100 watt machine, maybe I'd be using some pulsing system. But for 20 watts, I might even be able to chop up smoke rings because it's that quick. How much thicker than tissue paper or thin card will it go with 20 watts? I never go about using 20 watts in a conscious manner on the glass tube machine because 20 watts happens to be right at the top end of the 
pre-ionization frequency where I've got huge spikes of power and high, very, very high frequency. So I've effectively got something that looks like this for cutting card and it works extremely well. So our first test is going to take place at five millimeters a second, 100% power. I've left the frequency at 5.005 because it doesn't matter about the frequency if we're using 100% power. There is no frequency involved when you're using the power continuously. Well, the good news is the smoke is coming out underneath. That means it's cutting. That was five millimeters a second. Well, the edge is very black and the underneath, there's a little bit of color underneath. That generally tells me that we can go quite a lot faster. So I don't think we're going to step up in little increments. I think we'll go up to 10 millimeters a second next. Smoke coming out the back again. It's an interesting surprise. You can probably see the color difference there. We're getting lighter, which means that we can go faster because we're still too brown. Well, surprise, 15 millimeters a second. I think you can clearly see there the change in color as we go across the three of them. We're getting to the point where we're nearly there now. Still getting smoke out underneath. Wow. And the color's even lighter. 19 millimeters wow. a second. We're still getting smoke out underneath but it's not falling out this time. No, it doesn't want to... I would regard that as being no good. We've hit a rock there at 17 millimeters a second. That's not bad. Now I'm going to test my theory and reveal my secret. For these tests I've been using something that people have been asking me to do the times three beam expander which gives a bigger beam size. Now my argument all the way along is the theory that I don't want a bigger beam size. I want the smallest beam size I can get because I want to exploit one of the weaknesses of lenses and that is the central axis. The closer you can get to the central axis the less the beam focuses. Not more. And the less the beam focuses, I believe, the better the cut will be. So I've now swapped this times three for a times two. We've seen where times three bounces off the wall. In fact, it bounces off the wall here at 18. It won't deal with 18. Let's just have a look at what happens now when I continue this run. Times three. nothing else other than change the beam expander. I haven't reset anything except that's 20 millimeters a second. Twenty-seven, which will not push out. So the only other cutting lens I would contemplate using on this machine is a two-inch lens. And that's what I've got in here now. I've got a two-inch plano convex. This is normally set to seven millimeters. And I would expect this to be able to do mm, 10 millimeters a second. I'm getting confident now because this is a doing a bit better than I expected to be honest. Well, that made it for It's already sort of a pale brown so it can't go a lot faster than that. Let's try 12. Mm, well, just about I suppose. So, I'm now going to show you another trick and 
it just reinforces what I keep telling you about air assist and the efficiency of air assist. Now I haven't got much air assist on here, I've only got a little teeny weeny motor. If you look carefully just down the back there, I've got my motor hanging inside the machine. So it's actually suspended by some tie wraps in fresh air. And it's only a very, very small motor. It's probably only delivering about 50 or 60 litres a minute. I've already got the focus set, seven millimetres. I'm now going to push the nozzle down by the thickness of that washer which I've made out of MDF, three millimetre MDF. So I'll put that over the collar, over the thread there, and I'll put the lens tube back on. So now I've increased the distance between the nozzle and the, uh, the nozzle and the lens. So instead of a seven millimetre gap now, I'm going to have to set this to a four millimetre gap. We haven't changed the focus at all. All we've done is decrease the gap between the nozzle and the work to improve the efficiency of the air getting into the kerf. Just about made 12 millimetres. Well, as you can see, that more than just made it. 12 A A air assist. We've already got air assist on there, but we've just improved the efficiency of the air assist. Let's go to 15. Shall we try 18? 17? Let's try 17. Now, I'm just going to gently tap that, and that's 20. To the point where I think it won't do much more. We can try 22, but I think 22 will fail. It's, it's still on the edge of okay. Staggering, isn't it? All I've done is brought the nozzle closer to the work. I haven't changed the focal distance, the speed, or anything. All I've done is increased the efficiency of the airflow through the kerf to blow the smoke away. The smoke is absorbing the energy. And if you don't get it away quickly underneath the job, we haven't got any extra air assist. We've still only got about probably three at the most, four PSI. But what we're doing, we're using it more efficiently. We'll try 24. I think we're struggling now. Yeah, we are. So 24. Failed. Okay. It's quiet again now. So we can have a quick summary because I think this really is the end of this session. We started off with a boring bit about PWM, but the case is proven, so we can leave that behind us now. I have to say I was pretty surprised about the cutting capability of this machine with 20 watts. I thought I was only going to be able to cut tissue paper, in, but it seems as though three millimeter plywood has been a surprise to me. With the in compound engraving lens, we were able to get up to 17 millimeters a second with a three times beam expander. All I can say is to those people that thought I was being mad when I changed to a two times beam expander, what do you think now? My case is proven. I can do 17 millimeters a second with a times three and 25 millimeters a second with a times two. Because I think I understand one of the weaknesses of lens theory and that's the rogue beams as I call them that go right through the center. The more you spread your beam out the more you're making it opportune to condense the beam into a nice spot for engraving but the tighter you keep the beam the less you can control those rogue beams right down the center and they go right through the middle and they give you extra power for cutting. They don't just stay on the surface for engraving. And it subscribes towards the principles that I was working with in my RDWX learning session where we were playing with a seven and a half inch lens here and a two and a half inch lens here and managed to get a 30% increase in cutting ability. Not because we were expanding the beam, but because we were condensing the beam before it went through a two and a half inch lens. So I think this general idea about compressing the beam to put it through a lens to make it more efficient at cutting is probably something we shall further investigate and prove as a real possibility. Because hey, if you can get 30% more speed out of the same tube by just changing your lenses, 
It's much cheaper to buy two lenses than it is to buy a big expensive tube. And then the real surprise, I suppose, was the efficiency that we managed to get out of the two inch lens. Two inch lens? Well, we got up to 12 millimeters a second, but with a little bit of a fiddle to improve the efficiency of the air assist, we racked it up from 12 millimeters a second to 22 millimeters a second. So we more or less doubled the capability of the lens by just reducing the air gap from seven to four millimeters. Now, that's not unique to this machine. That's something that's unique to all machines. You don't need high pressure air assist. What you need is efficient air assist. We have established beyond any doubt that this machine works on raw PWM pulses. So thanks for your time and your patience today and I'll catch up with you in the next session.